Okay, so today I'll talk to you about uh, designing meta surfaces for optimal nonlinear uh, response. Basically, going back to the talk by uh, Tal Ellenbogen, and I will use uh, a lot of what he was saying. Uh, the work was done in the last few years, and uh, the, person, the people who did the work are these uh, three mostly. Uh, Yael Blechman, who was a, a master's student at the time, presently at the Technion. Basud Absain, an Indian postdoc who is now with Tom Sedgraf in Germany, and Euclides Almeida from uh, Brazil, who is now a professor in New York. Uh, you can design your uh, meta surfaces uh, either by writing your own code, or if you have $1,000, you buy a package, you buy a numerical package, and you can input the geometry of your uh, surfaces. And you can get basically the information uh, you need on the transmission and phase and everything. Uh, Tal indicated that this can be done. And these are a few examples of uh, what we did with various designs and various phase elements. If, for instance, you look here for a lens, uh, if you change the shape of the rectangular uh, cavities that we use, our meta atom is a rectangle. Uh, you can design, you can change the focal length, you can have the lens respond differently to different polarizations. Or here is a work that we did together with Tal Ellenbog and you can uh, compensate for aberrations by addressing in three different layers. Each uh, layer addresses an individual wavelength such they all focus in one spot to get rid of uh, aberrations. And all these were done uh, over the years, mostly with uh, gold surfaces, not only, but mostly with gold surfaces and cavities milled into them. The question I'm asking here is how to optimize the nonlinear response. Suppose you have your favorite uh, nonlinear process. In my case, it's a four wave mixing or a card process where you have two input beams, one out of three input beams, two red and one blue in this picture to generate omega-1 minus omega-2 plus omega-1 to give you the omega-4 wave mixing. And uh, if you want to optimize in case of molecular spectroscopy, which uh, myself and many others came from, what you do is you tune your lasers to the resonant frequencies. Uh, in metasurfaces, you don't tune your lasers, you tune your energy level, but the physics is basically the same. Okay. Now, as Tal pointed out, uh, we are not talking about the properties of an individual element, but of several elements. Now we have to decide whether we go with particles or with cavities. So let me show you what uh, we have some information, which is 15 years old, of two metal disks put together, and you measure the response uh, for two different polarizations as a function of the spacing between them. Uh, if the particles are nearby, say 10 nanometers or about 100 nanometer each in diameter. If they are close by, you see a big difference between the uh, vertical and horizontal polarization, one that's coupling them and one that's less coupling them. If you go to a larger distance, say 250 nanometers, there is hardly any difference. So somewhere around uh, 15, 20 nanometers, the, the, the difference of this uh, discrepancy disappears. Why is it so? Uh, let me skip this. Okay, let me stay here. Uh, it is so because what we have is we have an evanescent field inside the metal, similar to the picture that Tal has shown. The field between the metal, gold, and the air decays. The evanescent field range decays over tens of nanometers, as we saw in several lectures today. And therefore, when the distance is more than these tens of nanometers, the particles do not know of each other. So we saw it when we tried to measure second harmonic generation quite some time ago from individual such cavities. So you illuminate them with red, you look at the back reflected green, the two omega the second harmonic, and indeed you see individual responses from the individual holes. And then we went one step further, wanted to see the coupling, and we took uh, three such cavities. Uh, on the top, it's three particles deposited by uh, E-beam. And on the bottom, it's three cavities. Namely, there is a flat film with holes drilled into it. And you see the response to different types of polarization, two different polarization. One is along the triplet, one is perpendicular to the triplet. And in these top uh, uh, panels, in these top panels for the two polarization, there is hardly any difference. If you go to the cavities, there is a tremendous difference between the uh, 
connecting polarization, the one that connects them and the one that doesn't. And the explanation again uh, should be given because uh, two minutes ago I told you that if the distances are more than a few tens of nanometers, nothing should uh, talk to each other. And the distances here, say the, the gap here, is about two or 300 nanometers. So why do they talk to each other in this case? Why don't they talk to each other in this case? And this is the question. The answer, uh, if you think about it for one minute, uh, is also uh, not too surprising. For the particles in vacuum or in air, the evanescent field decays going from the metal to the air or to the vacuum. For the nano cavities, the uh, localized plasmon excited is similar, but it decays into a metal film. And in the metal film, uh, if the properties are right, if the wavelength is right, if the quality of the film is right, the metal may support propagation of plasmons in the plane. And therefore, the two cavities uh, couple through propagating plasmons in the cavity. All right, once we know that, we know that if we put many particles, many cavities together, we will have what uh, Tal called a collective response or, or just a general response of several cavities talking to each other. Okay, so coming back to my fo favorite four-wave mixing situation, the name of the game or the goal is to have a meta surface to design it such a way that if you put two beams, omega one and omega two, and you look at the generated omega four-wave mixing, you get the maximum intensity. And these are the parameters of uh, the input parameters that we are playing with. To make life simple, we started with rectangular cavity. So our atom is a very simple rectangular cavity, rectangular hole drilled in a metal film. I emphasize that it's a freestanding film, non-trivial to generate, but necessary uh, for this work because you are working in transmission. And therefore, if it was sitting on some uh, substrate, the signal from the substrate would uh, drown the signal that we're looking for. So we have an array of cavity. We try to change parameters of the system and we have only a single parameter to optimize at the beginning, only the aspect ratio of each one of the cavity. As I said, you can calculate uh, the response or you can measure it, we did both. And what you have here is you have the aspect ratio in, on this element, on this side, and you have the wavelength here. And this is the response. This is the transmission, the linear transmission through such an array of cavities. For, that, for the sake of discussion, an infinite array. What we see is that we have two modes. One is calculated, one is measured. We have two modes, one barely changes with the aspect ratio, one changing significantly with the aspect ratio. Okay, so let's look at a few uh, specific aspect ratios. For an aspect ratio of one, these are cuts in the previous three-dimensional plot. For an aspect ratio of one, this is the transmission. For an aspect ratio of two, the black one is the transmission, and for the aspect ratio of 3.6, uh, the red one is the transmission spectrum. Now, our frequencies are 800 nanometers directly from the laser, uh, 11065, and uh, the generator frequency is 645. Since this is the strong beam from which you are taking two photons, clearly the black spectrum with the strong resonance around 800 nanometer would be our uh, optimal guess. And indeed, uh, this is what we are getting uh, because the signal is proportional as we do in, uh, say, in molecular optics in AMO to the whatever is happening at omega one to whatever is happening at omega two and at omega four wave mixing. Uh, and this comes as a square because, uh, as we say, we take two photons from here. Okay, so this is what we calculate. This is the product, as we said, of this function, the product of uh, this transmission. And one of them is uh, calculated by a numerical, and one is measured, and we see very nicely that the response uh, is really optimized at around uh, this aspect ratio. And if you go back and you measure uh, the forward mixing, this is indeed uh, what you find. All right. The uh, spectrum that we saw had a resonance at 645 and at 800 nanometer. So these are two frequencies uh, that are important, but we have one more frequency. However, we did not have enough free parameters in the previous game because we used only one free parameter of the aspect ratio. 
But if you look at the set of such rectangular holes as is plotted here, we have more parameters than just the aspect ratio. We have the individual dimension of each rectangle, and we have the periodicity or the spacing uh, in the horizontal or vertical. We also have the film thickness, but the film thickness in this case, uh, we kept constant because uh, we wanted to do experiment on several configurations and to change the film thickness, you need to uh, design a new sample every single time you design a new experiment. All right, so we have four parameters to optimize and what we call a configuration vector is a set of these four parameters. Of course, you can have a different set of parameters for different thicknesses. You can have different uh, meta atoms which are not rectangles, you can have, you can play many games in this, but in order to understand the principle of uh, this optimization process, this is what uh, we chose. And now what you want to do is you want to find the best configuration, best is yet to be defined, but as I mentioned, best would be the strongest generated four-wave mixing. And uh, part of the work is uh, reported in here in this uh, recent, uh, relatively recent paper. As is known in the game of using uh, optical elements to optimize response, the uh, preferred method of, of optimization is genetic algorithm. And let me take uh, a minute or two to explain what it is to those of us who either don't know what it is or forgot how we all were all generated. And the idea is you start with a generation with a collection of random samples. Now, again, a sample for me is a vector of this type with these four parameters. So you start with a random collection of such four parameters. And then what you do is you evaluate, measure or calculate how good each one is. It's called the fitness. I'll show you in a minute uh, what I mean in this case. Now for, for each configuration, I have, a, I have a, a, a rank, I have a grade. And that is the fitness of this uh, configuration of this vector to the purpose of what we are trying to do. In this case, the intensity of the four-way mixing, for instance. And then what you need to do is you need to find or improvise or to find ways to improve your process. And just like uh, in nature, what you do is you rely on mutations, some deviations, experimental or intentional in the calculation. You take some parameters, some X and Y from different uh, uh, configurations from different vectors, and uh, you do what's called a crossbreeding. Then you select of these elements, you select which ones are the best or the most fitted for the purpose that you are selecting them. And then you repeat the cycle until the system uh, either converges or you're happy or you're tired or you run out of money or whatever you decide to stop. And then presumably uh, the system does not get any worse because you choose only better ones, but the system improves and you have a configuration that presumably is better than what you started with. Okay, so the question is, what is the fitness? What are you trying to optimize? So inspired by atomic and molecular optics, inspired by uh, our experience as a uh, molecular physicist or chemist, what we try to optimize first is the transmission at these given frequencies. So the function, the fitness for a given configuration for a given vector X is a product in this particular optimization strategy of the transmission at frequency omega one, transmission squared, because we are taking two photons at this frequency, times the transmission at omega two, times the transmission at omega four wave mixing. Now, again, this is completely based on intuition from uh, molecular, molecular atomic physics. Okay, when you do that, and you run through your process. Actually, in principle, you don't have to use genetic algorithm. You can divide your space to, uh, I don't know, 10,000 uh, vectors and calculate each one of them separately. Doesn't matter how you do it, but uh, we did it by optimizing through genetic algorithm. When we did, we found that the best fit, namely the configuration that gave the maximum for this function F was this configuration, the vector X. 400 by 100 nanometer rectangles spaced by 860 and 620 horizontally and vertically. Okay, the numbers by, itself, by themselves, of course, are not important. But what is important is that the transmission function 
now looks very promising. Before I had only two resonances, now I have three. So I have some strong response at all three frequencies that uh, I'm using. So presumably this will give me a good response. So in some sense, the choice of this function and the introduction of one more parameter, namely not just uh, aspect ratio, but also the individual parameter, now I have more parameters, enabled me to find a configuration, to find a vector, these parameters, that gives me resonances as I expected, as I hoped for, and we are quite happy. All right. But then we learn to use numerical, the package we are using, or actually you can calculate and, and write your own package, to calculate a nonlinear calculation and calculate the forward mixing intensity directly within the, the, the calculation. So we are not calculating transmission at a given frequency. We are not calculating anything but the direct forward mixing intensity given the input frequencies. Now, this is a non-trivial uh, step in the numerical calculation, but it's doable. There are many caveats on how to do it. I suggest if you're interested, uh, contact uh, Euclides Almeida. Uh, he was the architect of these uh, developments. And when you do that, when you calculate the forward mixing intensity directly, you find another configuration. You find a best fit. In this case, horizontal and vertical, 260 by 130. And the spacing is also different. So using a different optimization function, use, using a, a different target function, we found a different result. Just to remind you, this was the result before. Now, a uh, rectangle of 260 by 130 is very different than a rectangle of 400 by 100. The spacing are not very different, but they are different. Okay, so we have two results. Now, it's possible that two different optimizations give you two different results with different spectra and different forward mixing intensity. But when we calculated the transmission spectrum, of these two, the one uh, before I showed you, but when we calculate two of them for the linear optimization, for this dimension, for the nonlinear optimization, I'm showing you now the linear transmission. What we see is we see these two curves. The green one is what you have seen before. It's the uh, three peaked uh, spectrum, the one which has resonances as we hoped for near the three frequencies at the six, around 645, around 800, and around 1100. So this is good. This was expected. This is uh, nice. As atomic physicists, we're happy. The uh, configuration that was calculated by the direct nonlinear optimization gave this spectrum. So it has a resonance at 645, a similar resonance. It has something which is close to a resonance at around 800 nanometer, but is very, very flat in this region. So if you ask anyone who was trained in atomic or molecular physics, which one of these will give a stronger four-wave mixing response where this is one excitation frequency and this is another excitation frequency and this is the response, everybody in their uh, straight minds will tell you that the green spectrum is better suited for this purpose. However, in the calculation, when we calculate the four-wave mixing, now we know how to calculate it, we found out that the uh, blue spectrum gave a, a forward mixing intensity that was higher than the green spectrum. Now, this is very surprising. And uh, we were uh, bombed by it for, for quite a while. And my poor student had to repeat the calculation two or three or four times to make sure there is no error because my intuition was that this is impossible. How can the green, the blue spectrum be better than the green for the purpose of these three resonances, triple resonance. Okay. Uh, again, now uh, the, the, the previous slide was uh, calculated. This was measured. The measurement is more or less what uh, you expect in the calculation. The intensities are not the same, but the location of the uh, peaks are the same. So this is probably a correct calculation. And we measured the forward mixing. I will not go into the detail because it's less trivial. But basically, if you look, say, the brown one, we show it there near the peak of the measurement, you see that the intensity is similar. So we do not get a factor of three higher for the blue spectrum, which is on this side, 
but we get something which is more or less the same, uh, but still, it's surprising. So I still need uh, to explain to you uh, how this is working. Uh, to anticipate the question that uh, will probably come, at least it, come, it came several times when I gave similar talks in the past, you generate a forward mixing, but what is, how efficiently, how efficient is it? You say you can calculate the forward mixing, how efficient is it? And the answer is that the efficiency of the nonlinearity gives you results which are comparable to BBO. This requires an explanation. If I have time at the end, uh, I will uh, say a few words about what it means to be non, for the nonlinearity to be as strong as a uh, known or strong nonlinear crystal. Okay, so what we have now is we have these two spectra. We need to, and, and a strange result that they give similar four wave mixing intensity. And we have to explain what is going on. And here is the explanation, the way we see it. And the way we see it is that uh, you have to look at the propagation of the different waves across the sample. So what I'm going to show in this movie is a plane wave coming from the right, coming from uh, your direction, going into the board over two samples or over the sample. The sample, the thickness is about 250 nanometer. These are the X and Y dimension of the sample. This is the calculated intensity of the light as a function of distance as the light, the plane wave is propagating through the sample. This is the 645 nanometer, namely the forward mixing result out. And this is the 800 nanometer, namely the, the one that's most relevant going in. So let us look at uh, what's going on. They didn't start together, pardon me. But you look at the intensity, I'll show it again. Look at the intensity as the light goes through. They're supposed to go together. Let's make them go together again. Uh, look at the 645. It goes into the sample. It has a strong red area at the beginning. It has a very weak field as you go through and a strong field again as you go out. So it has strong fields at the entrance plane and at the exit plane. Now, if you look at the 800 nanometer, it's a very different result. When the uh, plane wave is, is reaching the sample, you get resonance enhancement. So you get a red field inside, but the red field is actually strongest in the center and weaker at the edges. So the two wave, the two wavelengths, the two uh, waves, they have a very different spatial distribution of the intensity within the sample. And if you now look at it, look at some cross sections on the top. It's the intensity uh, for the configuration that uh, is uh, proposed by the green curve and the other one is by the blue. What you see is you can see why the uh, transmission, the linear transmission by itself is not enough to predict the result. What you have is that here, this mode is strongest in the center well, here there is no intensity in the center and here there is little intensity in the center. On the other end, here, on the other, on, on, on the other hand, here, at the entrance level, you have strong intensity of all three fields. Now, if you remember, we are talking about the interaction of the three fields, omega one, omega two, and omega three. So in order for the uh, forward mixing to be generated, you need to have strong overlap, spatial overlap, namely, all strong fields have to be, all, all input fields, all generated fields and input fields have to be strong at the same time, at the same location. If what we have here is, yeah, we have enhancement, but the enhancement here is not, does not exist when this field is weak, etc. There is no overlap between the strong points and therefore the intensity here suffers. On the other hand, although there is no propagating mode, and this is presumably a local mode or a dark mode or whatever it is, it doesn't propagate, it doesn't go through. On the other hand, at the entrance level of one third of the sample, it has strong intensity and it overlaps very well with the strong intensity of the other modes. And therefore, this is the explanation why this mode or this configuration, even though there is no transmission, transmitted field at this intensity, there is still local field intensity inside the cavity, at least in part of the cavity, at the place where it is relevant and overlaps with the other field. 
the take home message, and I'm leaving a few minutes for questions. The take home message of this is that uh, your intuition from uh, other fields, from other regions of uh, molecular physics and resonance with uh, molecular spectroscopy and atomic and molecular level is very useful. The intuition without any heavy calculation or without anything, just a simple linear calculation, gave us a result that was almost as good. Not perfect, not the best, but almost as good. However, it's not always the case and you should not fully trust your intuition, especially that you can carry out a nonlinear calculation, which is not that difficult within a commercially available technique. So it is worth it to uh, probe the entire field with the expected real result, in this case, a calculated forward mixing or second harmonic or third harmonic or whatever, whatever your, uh, your uh, favorite nonlinear process is. For the nonlinear interactions that we are discussing here, and it's true for other nonlinear interactions as well. We did some work on uh, third harmonic generation and also on second harmonic generation. The far field picture might be misleading because of this overlap uh, of the modes inside or near the cavity. So it could be dark modes, it could be something which is less uh, strong than dark modes, some modes that do not propagate as effectively but uh, these modes exist locally and they are very, very important. And this leads me to the uh, next uh, point that uh, one needs to remember. And that is that these nanostructures are not molecules. They have a finite size. If you ask yourself, why is this nice story that I just told you not relevant in a molecule? Think about it. The molecule is uh, on the scale of the wavelength is of zero size. It's say an angstrom or, or a couple angstroms. On that scale, if the fields overlap, they overlap. There is, no some, there is no such thing as that in the first half of the molecule, the field will be enhanced. In the second half, it will not be enhanced, not for visible wavelength. So the finite size of these samples is important. Now, where is the transition from uh, zero size or to, to finite size? Is it uh, one nanometer? Is it 10 nanometer? Is it 300 nanometers? I cannot uh, put, uh, I cannot give you a recipe, but the question of how small is small is becoming relevant in, uh, in these types of configuration. And with this, let me stop and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ichiam. Uh, I wonder if there are any questions I don't see. I'm sorry, there is a Eco here. Uh, you see, I have a question to you. Uh, you use the non-polarized light, as far as I understand. No, everything was polarized. Everything was polarized. Yeah. Can you can you generate uh, also a spherical a spherical uh, polarization, or can you do uh, chiral structures with this uh, 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 manipulation? You're asking whether we can use uh, uh, samples, cavities, which are not rectangular to generate, say, circularly polarized light? Yes. In principle, you could, because uh, if the polarization, say, it's saying you take, even if you take a simple uh, a rectangle, the, polar, the, the response along the long, uh, cavity, the long axis or the short axis are different. Actually, uh, Tal Ellenberg showed you an atom that you can rotate, you can capacitor mm -hmm. rotate it rods and you can see that there is a delay and basically what you get is you can control the polarization of what's coming out to get elliptical polarization and what you want. You could do it, people have demonstrated that you can use elements which are wave plates or rotator or you can, you can, you can do that. But that will, be a, that will be a linear effect, not a nonlinear effect in this case. Mm -hmm. It will be a wave plate basically.